This is a CC Radio podcast. Welcome to episode 207 of the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast. Today we're going to pleasantly tighten your buttholes, peeps, in a good way, trust us. My name is Wayne. <laughs> sure. <laughs> My name is Paul. Welcome to the podcast. We count down movies, sometimes television, in order of awesomeness, so you don't have to. And as Wayne says, we're going intense on you. That's right. Real intense. <laughs> so intense, I haven't worked out a joke for it yet. So intense... If you put coal in your asses, uh, something about a diamond. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so intense that I won't use the past tense. No, moving right along. <laughs> all right. Well, that's fine. That, that, that was as uh, lame. They as don't all work, people. They don't all work. Or any of them. I mean, <laughs> one of the two. So it is the top 10 intense films. Most intense films. That's it. So that our, the best intense films. Films that, as you kind of colloquially described, don't let up. Exactly. So in my mind, it's films which, right from the get-go, grabbed you by the short and curlies and never let go. Exactly. And it's a little different to tense moments in a film. No, it's a whole this film. This is the whole film. So it's a little bit of a different one, really. Yeah, my, my, film, my list is basically which films were the tensest throughout, as opposed to the best film that had some tense moments. I think I might have gone the other way, except for oh, it was... It, no, no, no. I've, in terms of like, it might have been a tense film all the way throughout, Yeah, but I still had to like it. Yeah, yeah so. of course. Okay. It, right. They're the best intense films, not, okay. not the most intense films at that. Damn it. It's, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not unusual for us on the show to come at uh, from slightly different angles. Yeah, we don't think the same. We'll see how it all maps out. But uh, before we get there, let's do our plug, Wayne, for the Podcast Republic app. A good-ass Robusto <laughs> app. <laughs> That is for your Android device. That device. Is, that is, device. Device. Yes. So if you are an Android user and you're looking for an app to listen to this show or indeed any other show, check out the Podcast Republic app. My cousin Ash recently changed from iPhone to Android. What is he doing? Uh, he's I mean, just, so I, no, I gave him some shit about it and he's like, fuck you, man. And, and then like, we're like, what up, man? Yeah. Motherfucker. That's right. And I said, Android, but you're not a poor cunt. And he was like, fuck you. At least I don't buy the same fucking phone every year. And I'm like, what? And it went on and on. And it's quite funny, though. <laughs> Did, did he get the Podcast Republic app? Yeah, That's he did. The way it's it, the first you. thing he got. Thank you very much. I'm <laughs> glad that we finished that with something relevant. <laughs> Idiot. Oh, shit. All right. Now, we still haven't got a, a little opener for this yet, but we need to get to the results from last week's poll from episode 206, as well as a couple other bits and pieces based on last week's episode that people were good enough to point out to us. Starting with Julio. Patron to the show, good friend from the Contrarians podcast. Julio. He did point out, last week I was questioning whether or not in the book, Kathy Bates' character cuts off oh, James yeah, yeah. character's feet, or whether I was misremembering that. I concluded I was misremembering that. No, apparently she totally chops his feet off in the book. Maybe only one Fuck. foot, but it's definitely worse than in the movie. You Thank you for that, Julio. God damn. Uh, then Jason from the Binge Movies podcast. If you haven't checked them out yet. They have returned after a couple of years hiatus. A couple of years, wow. Great show. I really enjoy that. Uh, Jason and I may even have a little side thing that uh, we might be putting together once in a while. Very cool. In short order. Now, uh, I'm sure your legion have pointed this out, but referring to when you were talking about the BAT credit card. Yeah. He said, the credit card never expires because it says forever. On Does it. it really? Get it? Oh, my God. I did not know that. I thought you might have. I thought I might have too. You know what? This is odd, but that makes it slightly better. Not a lot and not <laughs> enough, but slightly better. Uh, now, 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 I do need to bring up the results. And boy, oh, boy. Boy, oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> It was 3-2 I was leading. Well, now it's 3-all. And, and this is probably one of the most comprehensive spankings <laughs> in the show's history. You, with your list of top 10 what the fuck moments, which was last week's show, mm -hmm. 44 votes. Wow. I did make it to double figures just <laughs> with 12. That is as comprehensive a beating as you can possibly take on this show. So, well done, sir. As I've often said, there are no losers here, Paul, because they listened. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> now, why did people vote for you so wholeheartedly? Well, Sean Ennis says, I like Paul's movies better, but Wayne's list gave me nightmares. Yeah, it's... So, I guess he wins? <laughs> You know what it was? I suffered for them and they were they were they they appreciated it. Yep. ATN said, uh, I'm going for Wayne because I can't admire how what the fuck he went. Yeah. It was nasty. I was even thinking it over too. I'm like, yeah, should I ah fuck it. Chris Yeeney said, I was even saying what the fuck for some of the films that Wayne actually watched. Pink Flamingo, <laughs> Piano Teacher. <sighs> actually, Piano Teacher you can get by. Pink Flamingo, do not go for you. It's just not worth it. And then Brianna Petty had summarized most of the love. Duck titties. <laughs> End of story. 
<laughs> if you don't know what we're referring to, then, uh, well, Billy from the We Watch The Thing podcast wanted to weigh in a little bit too. Great show. Do check them out. He said, I'm going through some old episodes of your show. And what are the odds that How the Duck would come up again in Best Buddy Couples for the same reason it's in your most what-the-fuck moments? Is it so? Now he's like to challenge you to work How the Duck into as many lists as possible. So I said, wait, Sold. you're obviously not talking about me. This must have been a Wayne thing. He said, yes, classic Wayne, misinterpreted as odd couples, which to him meant freaky sex couples. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm I'm racking my brains to to try and think of what how I mentioned it before. But I'll be honest with you, folks. Second this episode is over, I forget about it like a <laughs> fucking goldfish. I don't. I can't remember what I said, and so you know, I'm into it though. <laughs> but to be fair, I don't remember a lot of things about my life. <laughs> then John D said, "Want to see Wayne's head explode? A Tango and Cash sequel set in the present, and they're married." <gasps> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of hashtag ditties. Diddies. 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 Duck Diddies. So, yeah, that Fantastic. was, that was your number one. I love when Duck Diddies resonate with the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you did very, very well. Well done. Three <laughs> all, and we move into this week's show. Oh, my God. That's just, have I ever been in the lead before? Yeah, last year was spanking me early. And then it went over. So, this is that, Paul. This is that. Yeah, it's three all. Okay. Yeah, we'll, see we'll, see, we'll see how this lines up today. <laughs> I have noticed a bit of a trend, which basically is that uh, listeners tend to vote for whoever is out of their wheelhouse the most. Oh, interesting. I think. So, like, they, they appreciate the effort that you went to with <laughs> watching a film about someone eating shit. Oh, God. I still fucking have problems with it. <laughs> like, the horror ones you always seem to win because everyone feels sorry for you. Oh, yeah. No, that I do. I, and I, I, romantic I comedy, that. I tend to do very well because people feel sorry for me. That's a good point. But I do have one last thing to before we get into the countdown proper today. Go on. A little birdie, appropriately enough, tells me <laughs> that perhaps buoyed by your focus on ducks and their titties, <laughs> last week... You took a duck in for the night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I forgot you about this. Ducks on the brain, clearly. No, this was weird. I was driving home, and I right near the bins, it was bin night. As I go into the driveway, I see there's something moving next to the bin, and I look closely, and it's like this bird that's obviously been hit by a car or something. I'm like, shit. So I park the car. I come out. It's a duck. I'm like, fuck. Now what? I had to take the duck. Bring well, you were inside. like, hmm, titties? No, I did not. <laughs> I, don't even want to, I don't even want to see real duck titties, man. <laughs> So, long story short, we uh, took it in. I had to kind of keep it overnight and then it took it to into the vet. And unfortunately, although it made it through the night, yeah, I, I don't hear. believe it went there. So. I did hear. It, did, it didn't survive. I'm sorry that the duck didn't survive. No, I thought it was, it was yeah, very, it was very odd yeah. that the day after you spent so long talking about ducks. Yeah, you're right. You have a duck spend the night. Man. <laughs> That's a weird thing that no one's ever even said before. So, there you go. <laughs> Sense has never been offered. Ah, uh, there we go. That's the kind of entertainment we offer here on the countdown. <laughs> Playing a fast and loose today, folks. In case you haven't noticed. All right. Without any further ado, then let's get in. Oh no! One more thing. One more thing. What, what? The the movie watching challenge between Daniel from the IMDb Journey podcast and I continues. We are halfway through March. Daniel, according to the Letterbox scorecard, is four films ahead of me. 113 films of the year versus my 109. Holy shit. I, however, do have a few in the up my sleeve. I haven't got a chance around to entering in yet. So it's very, very <laughs> Paul close. Paul Stone points, everyone. <laughs> very, very close. That's all I'll say. Maybe Daniel's got the same thing going. So. I know. But no one, there's no clear winning yet. Of course, some of our listeners have taken it ridiculously beyond beyond uh, the, the. I love that. The Mortal Core there. I've seen over 150 films. Holy just Running shit. away with it. Running away with it. So there will be a prize mm. in the year. We'll, we'll talk about that more the closer we get. Uh, it's a, I think it's a two-horse race now anyway. So. Really? Wow. Okay. All right, that is it for the, the lead-in, if you want to call it that, for this week's show. On the other side of this music queue, let's do it. The top 10 most intense films. Films that are so tense, they're intense. Well done. Is the subject of this week's <laughs> countdown. Should have rolled without the early parts of the show. We should have. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Films that are extremely suspenseful, have you on the edge of your seat. Films that don't let up, as you don't let up. described it. There's no need to discuss the criteria beyond that, except for apparently you may have slightly come at it differently. Let's see how differently. <laughs> Lead us away, Wayne. No problem. My number 10 film is a film that Paul, in fact, took me to back in the Disney. Ooh. And it was a indie film, Ooh. and I found myself quite surprised at how engrossed I was in it. The movie is called Cube. Oh, yeah, okay, yes. nice. Just dropped on Netflix, by the way. Did it? Yeah. 
So if oh, you're that's cool. In Australia, at least, anyway. So if you are Australian and uh, want to check out the show after Wayne talks about it. Mm. Well, perhaps you will like it. See, okay, first of all, it is indie, so it is low budge. Don't be worrying about that shit, because I think it's still worth a look. It's about this bunch of people who, without remembering how they got there, they all awaken in this prison of cubic cells, and some of them are booby-trapped, and there's like this cop character, and a scientist, and a young math genius. A very odd sort of hodgepodge of people. Mm Mm-hmm. And they have to basically figure out what the deal is with these cubes and how they're going to move out of this facility, which seems to have interchanging different rooms that are all cubes that all have different shit that can kill them. Yeah. Well, every exit from a room, at least one exit is booby-trapped. That's right. And every exit has six. So you can go up, you can go down through the floor, you Mm -hmm. can go through one of the four walls. That's right. And it plays out from there. It's very clever because it's essentially one set that they lit lit all different times so they could have these supposed multiple rooms. But uh, it... Does actually it did actually? I remember when I was watching it, I was actually clenching the seat a bit, and I and I didn't let it go. Like my arm got sore, so obviously it hooked me for long enough. I was trying to talk fiance into seeing this the other night. Really, she's resistant, but now you've talked it up, she might give it a bash. Ah, all right, Patsy. Here's the thing: <laughs> don't expect too much. Just let it let, pretend like it's a it's a friend's film project, and then you'll like it. That's what I'm saying. It's better than Reap. <laughs> Is it a friend, not us? So, <laughs> uh, hang on. What? No. <laughs> well done. How is it possible? No, it's true. It really is better than Reef. <laughs> uh, yes, look, this uh, small fun fact about this film the director, his name is Vincenzo Natale. He was the storyboard artist for Keanu Reeves' Johnny Mnemonic movie. He went on to way bigger things than that. He's directed Splice, he's directed a whole bunch of other films. There's no way well. I will have seen Splice. That's got Adrian Brody and. Oh. and can't remember. Is it a horror movie? Yeah, sci-fi thriller oh, okay, with sort cool, of horror cool. elements. He's, he's done a few other films as well. You will you will have seen some of his filmography. Digging. So, Cube. All right. Apparently very nice. Netflix. That's a good way to kick it off. Number 10. My number 10 is not dissimilar in the fact that it's intense. <laughs> uh, it's a bigger budget film. Okay. It's one that you might have expected to be higher on my list, but I'm going to explain my rationale for it. Hmm. It is Alfonso Cuarón's oh my God. Children of Men. Oh, my God. Low. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. I was expecting something more. I thought this was a. I thought this is a one for you. Uh, it's number ten because it's it is intense, and there are some incredibly intense moments. If we're talking top ten tension filled scenes, I see what you mean. There's be space higher. between, but them. there's lots of space between. The film breathes. Mm. It allows you to catch your breath. It isn't quite as intense the whole way. And even yes, it starts off with a with a bombing and takes you by surprise. Yeah. What the fuck, really? Then it it kind of spends twenty thirty minutes setting up the world. So it's not. This full balls to the wall, intense hallway. I, you're right. The second half is intense the whole way. That's what I... Because I actually went back and sort of just skipped through it a bit, right? Mm-hmm. I was just watching scenes from it. And when you don't... When you take out the, so we say, boring or, you know, the, the 11 bits, right? And you're just watching long take after long take after long take, right? I remember just sitting there going... Because even when I saw it, the second half of the movie is when it took off. And yes. do you think to yourself, well... If it starts in the second half, I guess you're right. It isn't the most tense movie. It just has the most tense moments. Yeah. So, um, but that bit where he's with the we jump starting the car or he, like he's rolling the yes. car down the hill, I remember just fucking yelling at the screen. You go, come on! You know, like, <laughs> you fucking turned it over so quick, you silly bitch. Which and, is a pretty good sign that the film's fairly intense. Oh, and that and then him jumping between the buildings and stuff and getting capped and then getting set upon by Chibotel, whatever the guy. Edgeful. Yeah. That's a name I can say. Edge of, there you go. Well done. Uh, those things were all just the bomb. And I think, to me, it became a tense movie as a result. I remember it as a tense movie when, in fact, it was half a tense movie. Yeah. All right. That's my 10. All right. Not on your list. Oh, no. It's low. It's coming no, it up. Is. It's, it's coming up. up. It's yes. up high. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, my number 10. Sorry. My number 9 yep. is, get this. I know I might get some heat for it. I don't give a fuck. Speed. What? Speed. That's what right. The, what the hell? Ah, suck my dick, motherfucker. No. This is a terrific <laughs> ass popcorn thriller. It's taut, fact, it's tense, and it's energetic. I can go one better than that. You can suck my whoa, dick whoa, with your bullshit. Whoa, 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 Fuck whoa, you, whoa, asshole! Whoa, 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 What's with this bullshit? Two Will Smiths and a Rose no, suck a dick. That was actually Keanu Reeves. How the about suck one? my dick? What? Fuck off. <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, do I hear it again? No, whoa, fuck off! Whoa, 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 hold on. Ah, uh, fuck. I'm so sorry our listeners have to put up with your shit. <laughs> Yes, my shit. Fuck your you. screeching rage. <laughs> <laughs> At least that shit's organic. <laughs> um, everyone, speed. All right. This is literally a not let up movie. Okay. 
Keanu Reeves at the beginning of the movie, goes to get a damn coffee, gets a muffin, and then some shit blows up, and he gets a Dennis Hopper call, and that's it. No letting up from there. Ass is on a bus. Bus can't go past 55. Then they end up in some other bullshit. Past me under. Sorry. Under 55, yeah. Is it really 55 miles an hour the whole way? Yes. That's like 70 kilometers. That's quite a No, to 1.6 miles. 80, 80, 85 k. That's fast hour. for a bus. Yeah. Shit. Do the, oh, wow, yeah, that's a lot. Pretty sure the music from it now can feature. Is this the one that goes... <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, in my head it is. I don't know if it is. <laughs> I'll find out. Okay, okay fine. Um, but yes, I, I don't know. D- did you all... I mean, it's, it's fun to make fun of Speed now and all the fucking Annie this and the whatever, you know, and it's Keanu Reeves and it, you think it's popcorn. It definitely is popcorn, by the way. Doesn't mean it's not intense as all fuck, yeah. all right? Well, I was... No, I, I, it fits a brief. It does. I think so. Yeah. But I actually think as well, even with the train thing that goes through the bottom at the end, this was... That's where the movie ended. And it was not... They didn't let up all the way through. Even from when, like, the house gets blown up with what's his name in it. And then, yeah, Jeff Daniels. Yeah, all this shit. Uh, man, cool as fuck. And it never stops moving. This is the bomb. Great idea. Hmm. So, I'm expecting Speed 2 Cruise Control higher on your list? <laughs> <laughs> Look, <laughs> you can't go put the damn boat on there and say, now it's, now it's on the water. Okay. Pop you know. quiz, hot shot. Pop quiz, exactly. Okay. Although Jason Patrick didn't mind him. <laughs> you, you are a <laughs> weird defender of that film. <laughs> Hence my question. All right, my number eight is <laughs> is a film which I have to credit. It, it was on my radar a little, but then... No, I'm, I'm lying. The, the listeners reminded me of it, so I put it in here late. It's Alejandro González Inoratu's yeah. Inari yeah, Inari The Revenant. Yeah, I this saw, film was intense as fuck. I saw someone's um, who was it? David like, Powell. David Powell. Yeah, yeah, I think I saw his picture. I was like, "Ooh, that's a good call." But yeah. I already made the list. I'm like, uh, "Yeah," but it's it's definitely you're right because the first part of the film, the way I I love this movie. I am an ardent lover. I've it's a brilliant 4K disc. That's right, 4K. <laughs> For all those playing at home <laughs> on the countdown bingo. Thank you, Tara Maholic. Rich Gun. It's a gun. Uh, it, it's one of the best looking discs that I've got. It, it is stunningly put together. But I remember the first bit of the film, the whole time I was waiting for this vaunted attack. They get attacked by uh, Native Americans. That is... And then that happens. It's like, oh my God. And then there's a little bit of a downer. A little downer. Intention stakes while they're moving, trying to get away. That was the thing that I... Re- the... But it doesn't run for very long. No, I don't think it would. And, and then he gets separated. Attacked by the bear. Yeah. Oh, that bear. That bear thing hell. is hugely intense. And then the whole thing is... Is he, when we know he's not going to, but is he going to succumb to his injuries and how is he going to survive this? And this is bullshit. He's going to climb into a fucking horse and he falls off the edge of this and then he rescues some kidnapped person. And the whole time he's like, once what happens, happens, mm. he's chasing Tom Hardy's character and he's trying to get revenge. So once he's actually got past his injuries, now it's like, will he get him? Because this Tom Hardy guy, he is a proper prick. Oh, he's a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> but like, does he, how long is the movie again? Do you... It's about two and a half hours. Two and a half hours and it's intense all the way through, except for a little low, yeah. which by the way, they do need actual like plot in there. So that's fair enough. Yeah. There's, yeah, a, there's a couple right. of bits of flashes back to the fort. We see uh, Dom Hall Gleason's character and the like questioning the surviving men. And we, I see. But, Generally speaking, this film doesn't let up. I mean, you've seen it way more recently than me, and in fact, I've only seen it once, so mm-hmm. I probably would give it another go. Uh, but sure. yeah, fantastic. That's not bad. Thank Definitely you. real. All right. My number eight is a Denis Villeneuve movie called mm. Prisoners. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It did blink, blink on my radar. That's what I'm looking for. Sorry. I think why... Because I, I, it's hard for me to... I don't know. The, the movie is about uh, Hugh Jackman. His six-year-old daughter is missing... Uh, together with her young friend, and the only lead they have is this, you know, dilapidated Kill every RV. motherfucker. Yeah, exactly. And so, basically, it comes to light that Paul Dano um, is is caught by Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm just using the actors' names here. Yeah, um, as you do, as you do. Um, <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> and it looks, yeah, I do. Uh, and it looks very much like Paul Dano is actually the guy who took them, but they can't hold him because of a lack of evidence. So Hugh Jackman kidnaps his ass, holds him up in an abandoned house, and fucking tortures him. And so that is the whole movie. But as soon, I think this is actually one of my favorite examples of an intense film. I didn't see it till very late because mm. people told me about it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it shows you, like, it just, it, first of all, it throws you in because you are basically, as an audience member, kind of told by the movie, yeah, he actually did it. And then, you know, it, it, it goes on from there. I won't spoil it for anyone. But the torture scenes pretty much are You're Hugh not Jackman. told by the movie. You're led to believe. You're led to believe. You're right. And Hugh Jackman does stuff like by scolding him in the shower and beating the piss out of him, and just stuff like that. And you kind of, the whole time, you're like, shit, is this okay, or isn't it okay? I'll if it tell was you, as kid, a father of an almost six-year-old, totally okay. Totally okay, right? Exactly. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, look, I do think that. I, I think to myself, well, of course you would. How do you not do that 
if there's a chance you can save your kid, you know? It's, yeah. So fuck that guy. But that's why it gets you in, peeps. Mm. If you ain't seen Prisoners, I would totally give it a try. No, it's, it's well worth recommending. Great uh, ending, too. Mm. Mm. May feature on a future episode, actually. Interesting. Yeah, I won't say what it is. Okay, yes, okay, yes. cool. All right, uh, that's your number eight, seven. My number seven is a f- uh, probably the best example of an action film in... No, second best example of an action film in my list. It is a film from director Gareth Evans. We do sing its praises a lot on this mm-hmm. one, especially I do. It's The Raid. <laughs> I, this is an honorable mention for me, yeah, but it's, I totally could have been on my list because... You're right. Once it's violent, from, it doesn't stop being violent. This is 92 minutes, something like No, it's 101 minutes. First 10 minutes, set up. After that, does not let mm-hmm. up. It is balls to the wall action the whole way through. This, this, uh, if you haven't seen the film, you haven't heard us talk about it before, it's a small group of basically SWAT or commandos mm-hmm. uh, infiltrating a, a drug lord sort of uh, high rise 12, 15-story high rise, which he has populated with a whole bunch of near-do-wells on the lower levels. Mm-hmm. And basically, he says, once he becomes aware that they're in the building... Every person who kills one of these guys will get a huge amount of drugs or a reward of money. Yeah. And so the entire building is trying to kill these police officers as they ascend up to the top to get this drug lord. And, and it's it, fucking awesome. It's fantastic. And then when you start getting into hand-to-hand combat, I mean, it's very fortunate that one of the cops happens to be the best martial artist on the planet. But that's the whole movie, man. It's yeah. so cool. Yep. And beating up someone by smacking their head against the wall with you and me <laughs> multiple times all the way down... down. Who even there thought of that? Tra- s- and some then, incre- incredibly inventive shots when, in this film. That, when I saw that in the trailer, I was like, it's, it reminds me of the time I saw Bullet Time in the Matrix trailer. Yeah. I was like, what happened? What the f-? It was like that, even though it was nothing. This the same is a film I can watch again and again. Oh, yeah. It's so rewatchable as well, despite oh, yeah. that intensity, of, unlike something like Hey Hunter or Mumbai, which I'll we'll talk about in, I'll the, watch that again. in the upcoming uh, feature review. This one is, it's so rewatchable because despite the intensity, it's still. There's a fun element to it. There's an enjoyable element to it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's fun. And also, by the way, Hotel Mumbai was going to make this list. And I thought, you know, it's Honor- too recent. Honorable mention too, for me. It's an honorable mention yep. for me now mm-hmm. as well, exactly. Uh, okay, thank you. Your num- that was your number seven. Yep, I you for six. Uh, I said that was seven. That's actually my eight. My yep. apologies. I screwed that up. So over to you for your seven. My seven is Everyone Knows I Love Sicario. Ah, oh, funny that then, because my number seven is Sicario. Oh, good. I thought yep. I was going to be shit about it. Okay. No, not at all. Oh, my God. I think you like it more than I do, but as an example of an intense mm. film. The, I mean, look, I think we're all talking about the uh, when they come into Mexico over that bridge. That's the that best thing. scene. They're coming out of Mexico. Out of Mexico, from, that's right. from memory. But it starts off with a pretty intense scene, so it throws you right in. Oh, dude, in the, when they're casing the joint and yep. then the fucking kaboom. My God, what a great-ass movie that is. And the reason I kind of started watching Denis, like Arrival, I, I think I enjoyed Arrival because I was remembering how much he made me enjoy Sicario almost. And I did, I did well, that's the only reason you would expect to I like, love Arrival. arrival. I love Arrival. I think it's a great fucking movie. <laughs> Different discussion. Movie. Yeah, Paul and I used to always fight about this. But uh, the, I, but just, just on that scene with the fucking them going you know, in the SUVs and whatever, mm-hmm. what was cool about that was as it was ramping up, you, this dog is barking and it really agitates you as, as like, and you, it puts you right on the edge. And I think to myself, that... Whoever the sound engineer is, he's like, he absolutely knows what he's doing. He's made it just too loud to annoy you and make you pissed off. And then when shit goes down, you're right in there. Fantastic. Mm. Good ass movie. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It, it is a very tense film. I don't think I liked it as much as you liked it as much as a lot of people did, but it's a very, very good film. And even to the way it sort of ramps up towards the end when... Benicio de Toro's character is being escorted into Mexico and what's going on here. And you, oh, and man. Your point of view is is the Emily Blunt character's point of view and she's sort of new to this whole world and she doesn't really understand what they're really doing and she finally works out what he is a, a hitman. Yeah. And the government is repurposing him for its own devices. and Yeah. The, the A lot of people had this problem with the movie, but for me, it was the best thing about it, right? So Emily Blunt's story essentially ends before the end of the third act, right? Like... When, when most, most film, most stories end before the oh, on the third act. No, I'm saying it like 20 minutes into the third act. Yeah, because then the last 20 minutes is just Benicio, who turns out to be mm. the Sicario, yes, going into the drug lord's house, and then like you almost don't see her again until the very end, right? So people were like, well, well, they were expecting she was the hero. This no, it's cool that Benicio came up and became the thing that the movie's kind of about. Yeah, there's that scene. There's also a scene which we which was deserves props. So I would say the reason this is seven on my list and not higher mm. is because it, again, it's probably five really tense scenes interspersed with down points. Yes. Rather than other other films, and arguably the raid should be higher now that I think about it, and was no. until I screwed up my list. I- but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't because the raid is intense the whole way. 
I there's almost no time to catch up. Although I would say five scenes, five intense scenes in a movie lot. is pretty much the whole movie. Nah. Except for like... There's lots of talking about what we're going to do and how we're going to yeah, do it and bringing her up to speed. But then there's that scene where John Bernthal attacks her. That was intense though. That's it. That's like, I'm saying that is another example of those intense Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. No, fair enough. Okay. Okay, so cool. So that was both of our sevens. Yep. Back to you for your six. Okay. My number six is one of definitely one of my favorite movies. David Fincher directed it, mm-hmm. and it is, of course, The Game, with Michael ah, Douglas and Sean Penn. I yes. forgot, kind of forgot about this one. This is a movie about a wealthy investment banker, Michael Douglas, who's given this mysterious gift where he has to participate, well, Sean Penn gave it to him, where he has to participate in a game that integrates in strange ways with his everyday life, uh, presumably created by a particular company that does this sort of stuff. <laughs> and it, I know, it's very weird, it sounds really weird, but... No, it's be- great, it's great. I, I'm laughing just because of uh, the idea that this company could exist and make money off oh, this. Oh God, it's, but anyway. well, unless they literally charged $8 million yep. for every time that they charge, they could probably do it quite easily then. But because you never know what's real, and you don't know who's an actor, and you don't know who's in or whatever or out, you are engrossed. I think I spent this entire movie leaning forward in my seat. Well, I wasn't yeah, clenching necessarily. Yeah, so it wasn't anxiety type intensity. It was more intrigue type intensity. We could have called this, this episode... Top ten white knuckle films or something. Yeah, we probably could have done that because, but this to me as well, it was very intense though because it actually, I don't know. It, yes, it draws you in, but more than that, you're the people who are in danger in this movie. You tend to care about because you're not sure if they're innocent or I don't know. It's very interesting. But uh, long time since I've seen it. it, it's probably worth it. Oh, I'll definitely look again. My number six then is a the most recent film. Oh, geez, actually, maybe it's not the most recent film. It's very close to another one that's on my list from last year. Okay. And I dragged you to see it. We saw it at an event screening. We had to sit in the front fucking row. Oh. And the first of all, I think the very first scene in the film virtually has a scare in it, which had you going, fuck this yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> which was the cue to the gentleman to my right, who was not known to us, yeah. to, for the rest of the film, every time something scary or intense happened, which is a lot. Go, fuck, fuck this shit, fucking hell, <laughs> fuck no, the whole fucking way through the film. Isn't it weird how people take a cue from that? Yeah. It's like, dude. It's like, you gave him permission, now he was going to talk it up. I know, dude, you're not going to be this funny. <laughs> I'm just, I felt like saying that. <laughs> I'm, I am talking about Hereditary, directed by Ari Aster. Uh, intense. You're probably right. Oh, fuck, it was intense. Yeah, it was. I'm trying to think about how, how consistently intense it was, but you know what it was? Pretty, pretty it, fucking intense. It was, because it, it was overall this feeling of dread, yes. which kind of brought you down and, and kept this you expecting. This foreboding, this dread. Oh, so, big time. You know, the, the, the film end starts with, sorry, uh, uh, the mother, Tony Collette's mother, again, I'll use the actor's name this time, uh, dying, and then, you, so you, I was expecting, because we knew very little about this film, the marketing was very good about drawing you in, but not giving away what was happening. Big time. And so there's this sort of ghostly phenomenon looking around the back, what's going on here, there is that like the scare that made you go like, what the fuck? No, I, that was just more, because it didn't even give you the answer to the scare. It was no. just like, that looks fucked up and I don't know what it is and I was pissed <laughs> off. So. And then we get a, a huge development. Uh, there's probably a little bit of a little bit downtime there for the next 10, 15 minutes. Then we mm-hmm. get a huge development in the film which sets the, far, the film on a whole other, and I'm being very careful here because it's new mm-hmm. and it's just on Netflix as well. So get into it, see this film if you're at all interested. We sort of talked about it last week, so we kind of did there. We did. What the fuck moments. Yeah, right? yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. We did so, too. Uh, yeah, that, that, that moment. And then it sort of escalates up to this whole other level. Of when it actually intensity. gets to where it's going, yeah. I remember going, this is almost so harsh for me to watch yeah. that I don't know if it's stupid looking or not. I don't know. But it was, yeah, look, you should definitely. I bought it. I loved it. No, no, you. it's one of the better ones, but it, a lot of people. It was on my like top it. 10 last year, so Hereditary ah. is my number six. Okay. My number five, I've been waiting to talk to you about people. Uh, this is a little known movie, and it's all, it's one of those ones that I'm like, this is absolutely a gem, and it didn't do anything at the box office, and it is not well known. It's called Running Scared. Now, oh, do you remember this movie? I do? Yeah. Okay, so it's Paul Walker, Chaz Palminteri, and Vera Farmiga. All right? Now... Okay. All right. Th- okay, we'll check it out, right? This... Is, I'm surprised. Is this high, dude? Okay. I, I remember seeing this, not expecting anything, and then being kind of. I'm, I'll happy. I'll say it. Blown away. All right. This is, by the way, Paul Walker's best film by a mile, in my opinion. Okay. Oh yeah. And it shows that he's a real actor, and the and the directing With apologies the story, to all the Fast and Furious fans out there. I don't think any of them think that. <laughs> <laughs> Into the Blue is better than that. Part. Anyway. Oh. No. <laughs> Come on. What? No. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Anyway. This movie, Paul Walker is this low-level mechanic in the mafia who hopes to rise through the ranks by doing whatever he needs to do. And one night, this drug deal goes really wrong where these police show up, they try and close down the operation, and then you know shit goes down and these cops get killed very violently by gunshot. 
They give Paul Walker the gun that killed the policeman and tell him to make it disappear so it can't be used as evidence. But before he does that, the gun gets stolen by one of his kid's friends. And what ultimately goes through is that basically this, this him and his wife go through every almost different type of criminal in the underworld. Uh, and really quite surprisingly harsh shit happens. And it's just an extremely well-made, well-shot, well-put-together movie. And you should totally check it out. I think, to me, I never stopped. I think because I was expecting nothing. Mm. I was like, holy shit, holy shit. And he just kept on going up and up and up. This is from the guy that directed The Cooler. From the yes. Movie. and that's, I can't remember his name off the top of my that's head. That's the only reason I... His name is... Yeah, I didn't write it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Brilliant>. <laughs> Um, but like, I, I, the the cooler is the reason I saw this movie because okay. that was yeah. it. And then Paul Walker at the time, like we still thought he was just you know, Keanu Reeves. Fast and Furious, exactly right. But no, no, this is like the speaking of Keanu Reeves in Street Kings, mm. which I watched the other night. St- Dude, Street Kings this on, again on Netflix. Man, I was on a date when I when I was fighting with the girl, and we went to watch Street Kings because we were, that's what we were doing. The movie was so good it made our night better. <laughs> like at the end, I was like, "That was really good." Yeah, it was really good. And then like we became a better night. We had for dinner. It was awesome. It wasn't that good? It was fine. It was. No, that's a good. It's good. It's a good film. Totally. It's not. But just that's not that's where I date better. <laughs> it was for me, and I'm telling you, that's where I found out Keanu could act. So it's all about the director, people. Yeah. Keanu okay. can act. Keanu, Keanu has a certain type of role. Before that, it was all fucking Bram Stoker's Dracula, and like, get your hands off. Uh, how dare you, Bill and Ted? Fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah. How say no. dare you? No, no, no. He, yeah, whatever. Anyway. I Are you Keanu. saying you don't like Keanu? Oh, I love oh, Keanu. Good, because otherwise I'm getting John Wick or some words oh, to you, motherfucker. He'll fuck a brother up, no yeah. doubt. All right. No doubt. All right, well, is that it? You're done with your number five? I am. All right, well, it's a strange one out of left field. My number five, not out of left field, and everyone will have expected it on my list at some point. It is one of the greatest chase films of all time. What? Okay. It is also... The Italian job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. What That's a all dog. I need to do. Respond to that. No, it is Mad Max Fury Oh, Road. God, of course. Of course. It's on you. Couldn't leave it off the list. I'm sorry. I did leave a couple off the list that are I talk about all the time, so we'll get to those in honorable mentions. To be fair, it is a road movie that goes one way, then the other way, so it really hasn't got time to sit to, it's to, a chase to do anything. Film. It's, yeah. a cha- right, it's a chase film. Very first scene, he gets chased, he gets caught, he escapes. Uh, well, no, he tries to escape. They capture him longer. They chase someone else. He becomes part of that chase, gets on the other end of the chase, more chasing, turn then, around, come back, chase, 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 have to go back through the chases. Guitar dipping people on sticks. Yep. Yes. Action extraordinaire. It's so tense. It's so yeah, full it on. Actually, it doesn't let up. You're right. It doesn't let up. Not bad. So, had to be on my list, and I'm always happy to talk about Mad Max Fury Road. No shit. If How not, many times have you seen it? Just because I can then include the music, which is one of my favorite pieces of music ever made for oh, film God. on the episode. <laughs> Paul throwing his weight around as an editor. Um, <laughs> how many times have you seen it? Uh, six, seven. Six, seven times. That's yep. pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, nice. Is this part of your movie watching shit? Does that go on the list? Yeah, you're allowed to rewatch. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah, So I, I will no doubt. I haven't watched it this year yet, so it's it's, it's due. It's cool. that way. All right. Well, my number four is Children of Flaps, so <laughs> we can just we can just bounce right on. <laughs> that sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> Never use the word children. <laughs> And flaps <laughs> in the same <laughs> sentence ever again. That's just a thing I do, folks. I, I use the word flaps like people, like the Smurfs used to use the word Smurf. <laughs> just every noun, every adjective. Oh, verb. Does that mean there was flaphead in your world? It, flaphead? <laughs> oh, but there was Papa Flap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Now we know how Wayne refers to himself and his significant <laughs> other whenever he has one. <laughs> oh, shit. So, all right, so that was your four. Yep. My four is a film you've never seen, you will never see, and I don't expect you to ever see because mm-hmm. I value your sanity. <laughs> what? Small that it is. Uh, <laughs> it is a French film which I would suggest... Just sniffing tissue film? It's almost at that level. Oh, wow. It's from Pascal Lajure. Mm-hmm. It's Martyrs from 2008. Oh. I have spoken about it before. Tell me again how this is. This is a film basically which opens with what looks like a 12, 13 year old girl running away in absolute fear from mm-hmm. this abandoned facility. And then we flash forward 20 years, give or take, and two women. First of all, it, we get 10 minutes of sort of downtime establishing a normal family mm-hmm. dad, mom, the kids, yep. kids who are teenagers and the like. And then these two women break into the house and proceed to start to kill them mercilessly. Women? Yeah. 
and with what the like film gun? yeah, guns okay. and, and the like and Fuck. yeah and Fuck like, so they hell. look like they're the aggressors and whatever but then the film sort of slowly shows you that one of the women is that girl who's running at the start and mm. she is a survivor of severe physical uh, and sexual abuse mm. and yeah. the dad was a perpetrator of that oh so she claims yeah and her friends kind of helping her but trying to stop her and the film from there goes places that are is almost First of all, I would never describe because it it's a rule in the film. There's no point to watch it. Fair enough. But almost impossible to describe. Really? It's so horribly intense and awful. It, it's mind-bogglingly I'm grimacing hard just, to watch. I'm just grimacing listening to you watch it. Let's talk about it. Mean. Yeah. So if you've seen this film, you'll understand what's on the list. If you haven't seen this film, you probably have avoided it for good reason. But if you are that small percentage of people who are like, every film this list I want to watch, I'm into intense films, and you haven't seen this, absolutely seek it out. And then either oh yell at God. me or thank me later. Do you rate the film? Yeah, yeah. It's incredibly effective. It just it leaves you feeling icky and horrible and drained. Wow. Mm. See, I immediately I'm like, am I up for that? No, but maybe I should to be a no, well rounded critic. Don't no? do it. Don't do it? No. Paul straight up saying don't get, do it. You get a pass on this film. This is really? Not, this is no Fine, fuck it. I'm not doing it then. <laughs> <laughs> but if you guys are tougher than me, and you should be, <laughs> then go right ahead. Okay, my number three is Phone Booth, son. Oh, okay. Remember Phone Booth? I do remember Phone Booth. Colin Dan Farrell just walking his ass down New York City, like Times Square kind of styles, and then he picks up a, a phone from a booth that is ringing, and it turns out on the other end is Kiefer Sutherland, who is a damn sniper, who has a gun trained on him, and he makes him do all kinds of shit. Now, Joel Schumacher joint. It is. Shot for a shoestring budget of I don't know because I didn't write that down either. But, but definitely a shoestring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it from Wayne. <laughs> he knows his shoestrings. I know shoestring <laughs> thickness things. The, because it just follows him the whole time and you don't actually see Kiefer Sutherland until for just like blurred seconds towards the end. I don't know. I v- also sat forward in my seat on this one and I think it didn't actually let up because he never leaves the damn box. And shoot, you know, shooting happens. He does happens. towards the end, doesn't he? He has to pull shit at the end. But it's one of those movies where how can this possibly end? And from the beginning, you're like, oh no, how's it going to end? How's it going to end? And he tries a few times, nothing works out. How's it going to work out? And then you've got this like Forrest Whitaker being the cop who's like kind of knows what's going on because kind of sorting it out. Doesn't really, really, really cool. Um, I'm sure most of you have I'm seen I'm surprised this. it's this high, but I understand why it's on the list. I think it's a, just pure intensity. This is a pure, Pe- there's nothing else in this movie but one set. A couple of actors' voices over. It's pretty short and, too, so it maintains that intensity. It, yes, which I really liked. So yeah, there you go. Phone booth, okay. number three. Very nice. Speaking of short and to the point. <laughs> Not talking about my penis. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Good. I am instead talking about Alfonso Cuaron again. Hmm. Gravity. Oh, dude, gravity is the honorable mention for me. Oh, so close. When the when the space station blows up, that was whole shit. Apart from how fantastically it's shot, it's beautiful and it's put a together. Beautiful movie. And how good this film looks, and and I think is one of the best three D films I've ever seen. It's a, I know it's a short list of good three D films, but this one absolutely takes advantage of its. Of that medium. Oh, yeah. It's also just so full on, like, once the space station gets destroyed and everyone's dying, it's just Clooney and, and, and Sandra Bullock, who is the main character, left. Yeah. Whew. I think that... How are they going to survive? The whole time, you're like, well, they're fucked. They are fucked. They're fucked. Because they're in space, man. Yeah, because there is no more harsh environment. No, no more foreign environment. Even, arguably, sort of the ocean is yeah, better. Yeah, We've got more yeah, chance there exactly. than we have... Up in the in the nether region, so to speak, of space. <laughs> <laughs> in space as asshole. Yes. Uh, and then it's we're down to the one character that we're down to, if you haven't seen the film, being vague for spoilers. Mm. And holy crap. It has one moment. Yeah. One moment in the film where I was like, what? Well, that's shit. But then that's revealed to be what it's revealed to be. And oh, it's all yeah, okay yeah. again. I this honestly, is a sheer experience. I had, well. I had, I didn't think I had a problem with that scene you're talking about, but I remember going, "Well, is that just to fulfill certain contractual?" Yeah, yeah. Li- I know, but I, I think it's, I don't know, it's, it is a great, great movie. I heard someone talking about this recently, saying that um, they hated it because, like, the idea that Sandra Bullock is a reluctant astronaut is like you can't actually be a reluctant astronaut. <laughs> okay, sure, <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with it. No, he was just giving a shit. Uh, uh, yeah, look, I love Gravity. Definitely, definitely good call. All right, my number two. Is seven. That's right. It's seven number two. Yeah, I got you. Okay, so because it's been so long since seven opened and we're so used to hearing and talking about it, it's easy to forget how you actually felt about this movie. Do you remember that, well, of course, everyone knows seven, but, uh, you know, this this killer is going around, Kevin Spacey, and he's 
taking out people and killing them in John a style. Doe John Doe has the upper hand. That's right. He's t- killing them in the style in the style or theme to the Seven Deadly Sins. Now we all know about what's in the box. I'm not actually talking about that. I'm talking about the whole movie because what happens is as mm. each of them go okay. down. Do you remember the scene where there was a fat dude tied up and there's a bucket of vomit under him and shit like that? Mm. And then as each sort of really horrendous act goes uh, along, I remember thinking to myself, "How is the next one going to go down? And how did you know?" Wh- and, then, and then when it turned up, it was. Filthy. Worse than you thought. It, worse than I thought. Again, David Fincher, man. He's the best director in the world. That's it. Is it Andrew Davis Walker or something that wrote this film? That's, oh. it's, it's a three-barrel name. Have you got that so, detail in front of me? Yeah, you'd think I would, but uh wouldn't like this week. So close. Andrew Kevin Walker. Andrew Kevin Walker is the, is the writer. Same dude from memory who wrote 8mm. Oh, really? Man, this guy's dark. It is indeed the same guy. So he clearly has a few screws loose, but uh, (laughs) we are the recipients or the beneficiaries of said screws. Oh, yeah. And I just, I I don't know. I I guess for me, the... Uh, I the only reason I don't think about this movie is because it was unpleasant. But the the, I, the how good it really was is the is how I remember it. So yeah, seven man, seven is my number two. I yeah, I mean I'm not disagreeing. I yeah. understand that it is an intense film. It just feels a little high for me because there's all. Do you think it's, it's more? It's a police procedural, and therefore there is all this, and then oh, lots of talking about what we're going to do next and whatever. Then there's all this, and then it's like, like a bit See, more. To like me, a it was all up the heat time, but like I guess okay. because Please. I was I was just intrigued. So yeah. My bad. Fair enough. My number two is the most recent film on my list. I think it's about a month out, I think, from memory after Hereditary. I think you saw it in the end, but we didn't get to see it together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a quiet place. Oh, fuck. That's a good call. <laughs> this film is You're all right. built around suspense. That's a good call. You're right. It is. The entire film. Because it's so quiet. To the point of people, and I've heard this time and again on podcasts, just talking to people just on the streets about mm-hmm. this movie and talking it up. And they're like, oh, yeah. Oh, God. That film, when I saw it at the movies, I, I didn't want to eat my popcorn. I didn't want to make a noise. Yes. And for it to have that impact the on the your yep. viewing experience. Mm. And that was absolutely my experience in the I saw it advanced screening, which was, was fantastic. Wasn't that busy. It was from memory, it was like just before uh, Easter. I think it was Thursday night before Easter. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. well attended. But the guy, of course, in front of me to my left, uh, his phone went off. It was, <sighs> it was the night of actually it must have been late March, because it was uh the first night of the AFL season and he had some kind of alert on his phone come up about the game. Oh, my God. He's like, God. and fucking, I jumped. Did you jump? I jumped and, like, just glared daggers at him. And he was like, oh, br-. I couldn't tell how red he was, but he he, he cringed in his you seat. Know, oh, my God. You know what's weird? How does anyone's phone go off anymore? Who hasn't got their phone on silent know, all the fucking time? It should time? be the first fucking thing that happens when you move into no, a but, like, th- movie theater. Who actually keeps their phone on not silent? No, I, like, everyone My does. job means that my phone's always on silent. A very real. I take it off if I'm expecting a, an important phone call. That's it. I guess so. But I, mine never is on. It's yeah. Like, until the ring is never on. So, there you go. Anyway, all that... Right. that Everyone's anecdotal stories about watching this film are the saying, which is, mm. oh, whether you love the film or you disliked it for whatever reason, everyone agrees it was tense, it was sure. intense, and it was a very different viewing experience. Absolutely. So John uh, Krasinski's directorial debut, who has signed on to do to write and direct number two. How's he going to do that? Mm, interesting. Pretty I've even cool. heard a rumor that Emily cool. Blunt is back. So, well, I imagined she would have to be back. Well, I would have thought we would just take it from a different perspective, some completely other family or, or group that have survived. Uh, perhaps you're right. Mm. Wow. Okay. There yeah. we are. Good two, job. That's a, that was a, a really good place. call. Thank you. Well, let's give us your recap and then straight into your number one. Word. My number 10 was Cube and my number nine was Speed and my number eight was Prisoners. I'm just doing one line, like one yeah, word titles are. here. Uh, number seven, Sicario. <laughs> yep. <laughs> number six, the game. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Number five, Running Scared. Number six. What? No. Are you shitting me? This movie was so good, I want to crap my pants. This is a good. A- Running Scared, everyone, <laughs> is an unexpectedly good ass show. For real. For reals. So, um. <laughs> uh, number four was Children of Men. Number three. Wordy. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry. Number three, Phone Booth. Number two, Seven. And my number one, I'm sure it's your number one, but maybe it's not. Whiplash. Not even close? <laughs> Whiplash is on my honorable mentions. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, everyone, Whiplash is a goddamn movie about drumming. Now, I'm sure you've all seen it, but maybe you haven't. It's about Miles Teller, who goes into this school. It is run by J.K. Simmons, who's the biggest prick you ever met. <laughs> and he's, he's the basically orchestra master, whatever you were called, right? Maestro. I don't know. But teacher. he's a te- teacher. But he's so harsh on people that they freak out. You're drumming until you're fucking, literally, your fingers are bleeding and so on. 
And at the end, there's this particularly very intense scene where I actually forgot I was watching a movie where he comes out, J.K. Simmons basically tries to embarrass him in front of some very important people. He's playing on stage and then he just turns the whole situation around and, you know, takes the leads, shows off his talents. And eventually the teacher, actually J.K. Simmons, comes around and starts kind of helping him in the middle of that scene. And I remember going, I can't believe I'm even remotely interested in a drumming. Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair assessment and or statement. But all the way through, you're feeling his pain, and you're actually kind of thinking to yourself, is it worth the shit he's going through to get to the place that he gets to? Yep. Interesting thing here, Chazelle, Damien Chazelle, the mm. director, has weighed in on what happened after that scene. Oh, what did he say? He said that, because um, someone asked him, where do you think these two will go after this movie ends? They have that moment at the end of the film, but are they always going to hate each other? He says, I think so. I think it's definitely a fleeting thing. I think there's a certain amount of damage that will have always been done. Fletcher, that's J.K. Simmons, will always think he won, and Andrew... Miles Teller will be a sad, empty shell of a person and will die in his 30s of a drug overdose. Wow. That's what he said. That's dark. I have a very dark view of where it goes. I'm like, holy shit, that's specific. <laughs> All right, well, that's the director's prerogative to have that. Yeah. Exactly, but I'm like, wow, that guy just went there. So, so on, on my honorable mentions in my top, well, I've got seven there in my honorable mentions, so in my top 17, so ah. we're not that far off the mark. Uh, you won't have my number one on your no, list, no. but let's get to that in a moment as I read back through my much wordier list. Number 10, <laughs> Children of Men. Number nine, The Revenant. Number eight, The Raid. Seven, Sicario. Six, Hereditary. Five, the positively hard to say, Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> Just how many words there are. Oh, God. Three, sorry, four, Martyrs. Three, Gravity. Two, A Quiet Place. And number one is Neil Marshall's British horror masterpiece, huh? The Descent. Ah, you do like this movie. This yes. film is phenomenal. It opens with, you know, we get like one minute, maybe 90 seconds of happy families and laughing, cavorting. Then there's an accident which kills the child. Jesus! And the dad and leaves this Damn. poor woman alone in the world. And her friends a year later come together to take her on this spelunking adventure. Don't in, go spelunking people. Yeah. It's under the ground and it's caves. Ex ex and hence the tension. So, all right, once we get into the caves, which is probably 15 minutes into the film, after that, it immediately becomes tense because it, it's, it's apparent that these people, even though one or two of them are experienced spelunkers, mm. the others aren't as experienced and we straight away start playing with the conventions of claustrophobia and all this weight that is literally suspended above you and if it comes down, that is the end of you. I don't think I can handle this. There's a great couple of scenes where that is played to full effect and then the creatures come into play. And and Neil Marshall does a very smart thing. He doesn't really show you them clearly until the very end of the film, a la the Jaws effect. Mm. They're all women in this film, which is another fantastic little device in 2005, which is well ahead of oh, yeah, absolutely. the curve you on that kind yeah, of thing. You don't see that often. To have a horror film which is just about women and very few men, almost no men in the entire film. Mm. And that adds to some extent, I think, to the intensity of the experience as well because you don't even though a couple of the women are, play, are portrayed to be extremely capable, there's this sense normally in a horror film that the guy has to die second to last to leave the final girl so yeah, she may triumph, exactly. but he has to do something critical. We don't get that. Exactly. There's no component mm. there here. And in fact, the two most capable climbers, the two main characters, they are at odds. Oh, really? Yes. And so, and seriously antagonistically. No. Oh. Which is another element to the intensity of the film. I don't know if you call this spelunking or not, but I went down to caves and stuff like that. And yelling, up. River, yelling up. Yelling up, Margaret River, right? Yeah. And I remember going into them and like, there's not enough room to actually kind of twist your body in certain bits. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> so I think if I looked at this film, I'd be like, I don't think I can handle it. This is a film I would recommend. <laughs> really? Unlike Martyrs, this is a film you should watch. All right. Especially since we have the top 10 British films coming up. In oh, a really? Of weeks, so I understand that there is a the British version you have to see of this film. Correct. There's two two ends of the film. One is the sanitized American version and one is the real the way it was meant to end British version. The reason we have a Descent 2 is because they went with a sanitized uh, American version, which is not a patch on this film. Okay, fair enough. All right, that may happen. That may happen. There it is. Our most intense films of all time. We want to hear how you thought about our list, but uh, after we hear what you actually did think of your top three in the top ten. But before we get there, quick mentions. Let's just run through them fast, Wayne. Mm -hmm. Honorable mentions that haven't been spoken about today. Totally. Nightcrawler. Black Hawk Down. Not cool. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, the other two... Uh, uh, I thought City of God was very intense. Yeah, um, okay. It's yep. not quite an intense movie. Yep. Um, Gone Girl, I wrote and read a lot about, and mm -hmm. I just went, nah, it's not as intense as the other one. Um, I didn't want to say Saving Private Ryan. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually didn't even put on my mentions because it has some incredibly 
intense moments I filmed so much so as, as I famously have recounted yeah. the, the guy yelling in the cinema yeah. but there are lots of it's other not, scenes yeah, in it's the it's not film. the intense yes. film it's intense yep. bits in the film and I just said run, roller, run remember run, roller, yeah. run yep. run, roller, run that was good yeah, yeah good one uh, The Thing was the obvious one which could have been on my list that's of pretty course. intense the whole way through but I talk about it all the time I know so but I sometimes just, I do that with I just took it out of the equation it should be on this list but I just I just couldn't do it again uh, yeah. We mentioned Hotel Mumbai. The Matrix, I think, is a really intense film. Really? Yeah, because like, the first part is what's going on. He's being right. led around. Yeah, yeah, good point. Then he's taken into this other world, literally, and it's like, what the fuck's happening here? And then he's being pursued by the agents he's having to fight back, and so that's pretty intense. Yeah, cool. Training Day. I know you don't yes. like to these Antoine No, 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 no. This is his one thing that he did. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Whiplash, and also I had Rick. And I was going to make a gag at number one, which I forgot, and I was going to say, and my number one is, of course, The Mist. And that's for you, David Powell, <laughs> who reckons I that's pick it every me. second week, <laughs> which is also intense, but not good enough to make my top no. seventeen. Yes, fair enough. Oh, that's big. All right, that's nice our one. list. Then let's hear about your list in our segment that we call the Pop Ten. Talk about Pop Ten. Talk about Pop Ten. All right, kicking off this week's Pop Ten then with the aforementioned Billy from We Watched a Thing, who had number three. I shall read it the other way. Number one, Sicario. Yeah. Number two, Misery. Ooh. Number three, How the Duck. That sexual <laughs> tension was crazy. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, oh good. Oh, good. <laughs> Ryan L. Terry had Hereditary, mm. Misery Again, Whoa. and Requiem for a Dream. I never saw that. Ooh, yeah. Maybe, maybe. Heard it was harsh. Maybe you should. Okay. J Movie Talk Podcast, Mad Max Fury Road, The Horde, which is a French zombie film. Oh, really? Which is pretty good. Okay. Pretty good. And again, Misery. What the hell? I feel like we've missed the boat here, according to the listeners. Sudden Double Deep Podcast had Shit. Wreck, Green Room, not, not the last time we, that one we mentioned, mm-hmm. and The Raid. Mm-hmm. Good. FYFC Studios, Green Room again, High Tension, another French film. I'm getting a sense here of French intense, yeah? What is Green Room? Green Room is the film with Antoine. Uh, no, what's his name? Anton Yelchin. Yelchin. Yeah, he, his second last film before he passed away is mm-hmm. basically about a, a band, punk band that uh, playing gigs and they do this sort of out of the way gig somewhere and witness something they shouldn't witness in a neo-Nazi kind of bar. Oh, and Patrick Stewart is sort of the guy running it, and he's like, "Well, we have to kill him." Whoa! And so they're trapped in the green room at the back barricaded themselves in whilst all these neo-Nazis are trying to get in to kill them. Damn. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Well worth, well like worth a look. Like I liked it. it. I didn't love it. I, was, I had okay. I'd been oversold on it, I think. Okay. So my expectations were really high. Mm. Uh, and FYFC finished off with The Strangers with um, Scott Speedman and Liv Tyler. You know, the film where they just, whatever they are, in a hotel somewhere or a house somewhere and then maybe it's their home they come back to. I can't remember. Anyway, this group of people just break into the house. Really? And... They're all wearing masks and they proceed to do terrible things to Oh, them. really? And when they say, well, why Why us? What did we ever do to you? You were home. Or you answered the door or something like that. Okay, no. I prefer The Stranger, which is the movie where you lie on your hand <laughs> and then beat off. The movie or the move, did you say? <laughs> I said a movie, but it's a movie. <laughs> okay. Nick Pilotichuk, Heat, Mad Max Fury Road and The Dark Knight. Heat. Good one. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Sam Hurley from the Movie Reviews and 20 Qs podcast out of New Zealand, Green Room, Children of Men, and number one, Avengers Infinity War. Just because I was so personally and emotionally invested in these characters, and after Hemdale and Loki went down so soon, I knew no one was safe. I love that. I, I love the Marvel movies, and I'm shitting my pants for Endgame. I'm hoping for, I'm just hoping they don't fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Dear Daniel Movie Podcast, Children of Men, The Thing, and Night of the Hunter. Mm, Night of the Hunter, yep. Dan Folks had The Ray, Children of Men, and Dunkirk. <laughs> what? I knew you would be happy with that one. <laughs> Dunkirk. Yeah, but like, can things really be intense if they're 18 hours long? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> that shit is cold. <laughs> JB had Sicario, A Quiet Place, and Room. And said that Free scene. Yeah, where Jacob Tremblay is trying to escape will forever be the most anxiety-inducing scene of all time for me. You've seen this? Yeah. Is it? You haven't seen it? No, I, I'm scared. <laughs> I, was, I was told that it was like really hard to watch. Sometimes. Sometimes you, you got to not be a bitch? Yeah. I understand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then live it. 
Uh, all right, three different ones here from Spoonlamp, who actually gave us about ten. But I'll read the first three. Way of the Gun. Oh, really? Was okay, it? okay. Aliens. Yeah, I can see. Sure, that. sure. Yeah. And Gravity. From Comp My Pod podcast, Sarah. Sarah from that show, Killing Them Softly. Yeah, do you uh, know that one? Brad Pitt show. I think it's a Brad Pitt show okay. with Ben Mendelsohn. Mendo. If I'm not. Yeah, Mendo. 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 All right. Mendo. Uh, Alpha, which was a relatively recent film, and Heat again. Mm, good one. Gerald from Two Pairs on a Podcast, who welcomed his new child into the world last couple of weeks. Congratulations, Congratulations son. Char- Gerald. Uh, Seven, Hereditary and Audition, the Takashi Miike film from 1999. You seen is, it? Yep. Good. Pretty, pretty, pretty intense. Wow. Dumb Guzzler Podcast, The Negotiator, Behind Enemy Lines. What is that? A negotiator? Is that the Kevin Spacey? Yeah, Kevin Spacey, Spacey Samuel Jackson, Jackson one. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Behind Enemy Lines. I love that. I love Behind Enemy Lines. And Baywatch. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> you. All right, last couple from our Facebook listener community. David Powell, the aforementioned, had number three, Mad Max Fury Road. Number two, The Raid. Woo! And number one, Daniel Henderson from the IMDb Dune mm-hmm. podcast. Mentioned him earlier too. Also mentioned this one. Wages of Fear. I challenge anyone to so much as whisper during Clouseau's masterpiece about four men transporting trucks filled with nitroglycerin over mountain roads. Every pothole makes you hold your breath. Well-deserved Golden Bear and Palm Dior winners from 1953. What's it called again? The Wages of Fear. Wow. I have got that film now. Looking forward to really? watching it. Really? Nice yep. one. Thank you for the recommendation, guys. Stephen Croon had Children of Men, Deliverance, and The Thing. Mm-hmm. Good one. Jordy Davis had Bringing Out the Dead, The Game. There you go. And Training Day. Nice. And lastly, James Spence had Reservoir Dogs, The Thing, and Wind River. Yeah, Wind River, if it was more tense for more of it, I would have gone there. I would say the last the last that, half of that film. Yeah. But even the whole... Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yep. Yeah, okay. Anyway, great choices. Thank you so much to everyone. Sorry I couldn't get through them all. Once again, we had a lot of feedback. And we Thank really, you, guys. Really do appreciate it. Uh, and how do people give us feedback about the topics each week on the show? Just Google the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast or search for that same name on Facebook or send us an email at thecountdownpodcast at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter at the Countdown PC. You can also get it to us on the Facebook list community if you're a member and the link is in the show notes. Hit us up. We had a couple of reviews this week. Thanks so much to people who took Thanks, the guys. time. His reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to us. All those reviews really do help the show. It's greatly appreciated. And if you're not a member, we have a Patreon page. Head on over to the link in the show notes and join up for a whole bunch of extra content, which has actually grown to be quite substantial. There's a now. lot of crap there now. <laughs> I mean, good crap. Good way to sell it. There's a lot of good Excellent. crap there. There are some uh, stories about us you don't want to know about. That, that, that is absolutely true. In fact, Wayne is clearly the best marketer. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Well done. Well done. <laughs> and you haven't guessed Wayne's real job in real life is as a marketer. <laughs> Sadly, not the best around, though. <laughs> All right, Wayne, what are we doing next week for episode 208? Top 10 British films. Excellent. <laughs> Coincides nicely with the fact that I just got notification through that the Master Debaters have released their episode, which we feature in. Oh, nice. So if you're at all interested, head on over to the Master Debaters and check out their most recent ep. I think maybe their first for 2019. We sing too much in that episode. <laughs> I sing too much. No, no one thinks you sing singing. too much. <laughs> but it's great. It's it's awesome. a lot, it was a lot of fun. Great fun. And thanks to the guys having us on. Uh, yeah, so top 10 British films, which should be very interesting. We're going to do some geographical ones through the course of the year, kicking it off with British films. Yes. And then the week after, with thanks to patron at the top level, Sally Vaughan, we're going to be doing the top 10 ambiguous endings in mm. films. So it'll be spoiler, obviously filled, but it should be a lot of fun that episode yeah. as well. All right, that is it for this week's episode of the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast. My name is Paul. My name is Wayne. And this has been The Soundboard. Where is your honor, dirtbag? You are an absolute Suck my dick. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking shit. (laughs) Accurate. We will catch you next week. My name is Paul. My name is Wayne. And this has been The Soundboard. I stand resolute, motherfucker. You, okay, okay. This, you, you, <laughs> this is not... This is not. You can't put the sound drop of you because it just sounds like you're saying it and people are going, that was the worst delivered line ever. You... <laughs>
Or at least talk over it while you do it. <laughs> Damn it, bitch. Listen. Listen and learn, bitch. I'm sorry, everyone. 